Good afternoon. On behalf of Old Dominion University and the Redes Program Planning Team, I would like to thank Dr. David Bowles for joining us today. I'm Giovanna Gennard, co-chair of the Remote Experience for Young Engineers and Scientists program known as Redes, and I will serve as your host for today's event, Reflection on a 40-plus Year Aerospace Career, featuring Dr. David Bowles. The purpose of the Global Redes program is to offer Good free afternoon. virtual learning the experiences. Of the, University in the, Redes... the purpose of the Global Redes program is to offer free virtual learning experiences that increase science literacy, inspire and train future generations of STEM age students. Today's discussion with Dr. Bowles offers us insights into his professional journey of more than 40 years in aerospace, including future innovations. Throughout this webcast, you may submit questions through the Q&A box on your Zoom screen, mine's at the bottom. And following his lecture, we will answer as many of your questions as time allows. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Bowles. Dr. David Bowles is the first executive director of the Virginia Institute for Space Flight and Autonomy at Old Dominion University. This institute is chartered to grow the entrepreneurial ecosystems for spaceflight and autonomy in Virginia through industry, academic, and governmental partnerships, leveraging the expanding space facilities and growing capability to support advances in satellites and autonomous systems, the sensors they carry, and the data they produce. Prior to his appointment at Old Dominion, Dr. Bowles served as NASA Langley's Research Center for 39 years and served as the center director from 2015 until his retirement in 2019. As center director at NASA Langley, he focused on transforming the work, the workforce, and the workplace with widespread use of emerging digital and autonomous technologies, including turning the 700 acre research campus into a test range for class D autonomous research and operations. Dr. Bowles is an active, is very active in aerospace and local communities. He is an associate fellow of the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics and currently serves on the boards of the Eastern Shore Community College, the National Institute of Aerospace, the Virginia Unmanned Systems Center at CIT, and the Virginia Aerospace Business Association. He's also a member of the Virginia Governor's Aerospace Advisory Council and served on the expert panel for the Commonwealth Research and Technology Strategic Roadmap, sponsored by State Council for Higher Education and the Virginia Research Investment Committee. Dr. Bowles earned his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in engineering mechanics from Virginia Tech. He has been the recipient of numerous awards, including the Presidential Rank Award of Merit as Executive as a member of the Federal Senior Executive Service, NASA's Distinguished Service Medal, and NASA's Outstanding Leadership Medal. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Bowles to Redes. Welcome, Dr. Bowles. Hey, uh, good afternoon, and thank you, Giovanna, uh, for that very, very kind uh, introduction. Let me get set up here and share my screen. Uh, let's see. Optimize there, there. Okay, let's see. I need to go back. Okay, there we go. So um, again, thank you, Giovanna, for the kind introduction, uh, and thank all of y'all uh, online for joining uh, this afternoon. And kind of keeping with the uh, theme of of Reyes, um, you know, uh, remote experience for young engineers and scientists. I'll, I'll keep the talk at somewhat of a, a general uh, level, not a, a specific deep dive on any one technical uh, aspect and, and just try to share more of, of what I've observed and, and have experienced over this 40 plus um, year career. So, um, with that, let's go on and get started. Uh, all right, so here are the topics I plan on covering today. Talk a little bit about my background and journey uh, and some lessons learned al along the way. Um, also, we'll share um, kind of some special moments and, and um, activities 
that I had the very fortunate, uh, very fortunate to to experience. And I don't do this as a way to boast, uh, although I did have a pretty cool job. I used to use that line all the time when I was center director. Um, I had the coolest job on the planet, and it was pretty cool. But I, I did have the opportunity to participate in a lot of things. But again, I'll share some of those not as a way to boast, but hopefully as a way to inspire. If if we have some young people. Uh, online today, uh, whether you're in college or high school or thinking about STEM careers or thinking about uh, a career change, uh, aerospace can be very exciting. Uh, and hopefully uh, sharing some of the things I've experienced will help um, convey the sense of excitement. So let's start with kind of my background and journey. And Giovanna touched on some of this, um, kind of the basic facts. I was born, raised, uh, educated, lived, raised a family, uh, and worked all in Virginia. And I don't say that as a um, as a tourism uh, plug for the Commonwealth of Virginia, although I am a state employee. But uh, that's that. I, I just uh, make that point is um, it probably has influenced uh, some of my choices and decisions along the way. I have a lot of. Uh, passion for the state of Virginia, and, and it's been very good to me, um, and uh, that it probably has influenced some of my choices, but that's the, that's the only reason I point that out. As far as education, uh, I am, um, went through the public school system, actually in Richmond, uh, Virginia. Uh, as Giovanna said, I went to Virginia Tech, and got my bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees in engineering mechanics. Um, I didn't do all of that in a row. I uh, got my bachelor's and master's uh, and then took, um, I guess it was about four or five years. Um, I worked uh, at NASA Langley for, for the first four or five years, went back um, and took my classwork uh, for my PhD, then did my research for my dissertation and um, got that about four or five years later. Again, um, you know, th th that worked for me. Uh, I know a lot of people who go all the way straight through. Uh, it just kind of was whatever uh, kind of works uh, for you. Job history. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, first job, um, really interesting. I don't know how, sometimes I look back and wonder how that's impacted my, uh, my career going forward. But I was in uh, retail clothes uh, sales. Uh, this was during high school. It was a small family owned uh, business. They had about seven stores uh, in Richmond. So it wasn't a big chain retailer. It was a uh, kind of family owned affair, but they did have multiple stores and I worked actually in most of them. I will say um, when I was starting college, uh, I was still working there. I think even, yeah, the summer right before I started college. Uh, and actually uh, I'd planned on going into engineering. Um, uh, the the owner and the owner's son of the company talked to me and said, wow, you know, we really like you. You've been working with us like three or four years now. We You ought to go into business. You know, you can come back and we can, uh, <laughs> you can work your way into the family business. And um, didn't, didn't, uh, didn't make that decision. Obviously stuck with engineering. Uh, actually looking back, I think the company probably went out of business uh, probably about 15 or 20 years later. So I'm probably glad I didn't uh, take that path, but it was fun. I, I will tell you the one thing I learned, I did enjoy um, dealing with people. Uh, that was kind of my first, uh, first chance to deal with people. So that was, uh, that was fun. Uh, second job, I worked with the state water control board. It was kind of at the state level. Um, I guess what you'd call part of the environmental protection agency at a federal level, but focused just on water. Um, and I got the chance really to do a lot of water sampling. So I got to travel all over the state. I did a, uh, two different summers. Um, that was great. I really enjoyed that. You got to really go to a lot of rem remote places within various parts of the state from one end of it to the other. So that was a lot of fun. Third job and uh, the longest one was NASA Langley. Um, actually started there, let's see, the summer before my senior year, my advisor, uh, as an undergraduate was, had some grants at NASA Langley. He was doing some work there. He said, Hey, do you want to come, um, 
I need some help down there during the summer. You want to come and work there for three months during the summer? I said, absolutely. It had been a kind of a dream of mine. Um, you know, I grew up um, during the whole Apollo era. I was 13 in, uh, do I have that right? Yeah, 13 in 1969 with Apollo 11. So that, that had a big impact on me. So the chance um, to work at NASA was a little, kind of like a dream come true. So I took him up on that. Uh, that worked out. There was actually, uh, he ran a graduate co-op program uh, with NASA Langley in the materials area. So I got into that and that led to the, to the job. So I started at NASA Langley in 1980. And as Giovanna said, I retired in 2019 late in the year. So uh, just an amazing, an amazing career and uh, very blessed. Um, and got to do, like I said, got to do a lot of cool things. And I'll try to share some of those as, as I go through this. Fourth job, who um, was with uh, VISA, uh, the Virginia Institute for Space Flight and Autonomy, as we call it, um, which has caused a little bit of confusion with some people. Uh, visa, you got the credit card, you got the whole passport um, type visa. So um, it was funny when I took the job, I said, hey, can we, can, is, can we call it that? And they uh, said, yeah, sure. It's not trademark. So, um, and it, it, does, uh, it does make it a lot easier than spitting out uh, visa every time you want to uh, say, um, given the whole title, every time you want to say where you work. So it's been a new journey. Um, you might wonder how I ended up with this particular journey. Um, I, I, it really hit three passions uh, of mine that I was looking to do, uh, probably four, but I'll, I'll touch on the main three. First of all, I wanted to stay involved in aerospace. It's obviously been, been uh, the majority of, of actually my life up to this point. Um, I wanted to do something related to education. I have a lot of passion around education. Uh, and I wanted to do something uh, with the Commonwealth of Virginia. Kind of goes back to that um, first bullet at the... Uh, Top of the slide there, um, you know, I have lived my whole life here in the Commonwealth and I really wanted to uh, have a chance to, to give back and do something for the Commonwealth. So that led to this job. It's been, let's see, two and a half years uh, now. Uh, plus it, it uh, started at a strange time, uh, just a few months before the pandemic uh, kicked in. So an interesting time to start a new career a uh, new journey, new job, uh, new house. So Visa is located on the Eastern shore of Virginia. Uh, if you're not familiar with Virginia, that's that peninsula of land that comes down from Maryland um, and uh, kind of frames the Chesapeake Bay. So you have the Atlantic Ocean on one side and the Chesapeake uh, Bay on the other side. Very rural location, but also a very exciting location when it comes to aerospace. Uh, it is one of four spaceports in the United States that you can launch all the way to orbit. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how those terms are defined. But right now, it's, it's only one of four in the U.S. that goes all the way to orbit. Uh, so pretty exciting. You have NASA Wallops uh, flight facility up there close to the spaceport. So uh, and part of Visa's job is to try to help leverage and grow the tremendous aerospace uh, assets we have in the state. So, but again, uh, doing all of that uh, at the um, at the beginning beginning of a two plus year pandemic was an interesting exercise, and probably has its own set of lessons and and that you can learn from that. And, and again, I'll probably share some of those. So let's go to the next one. Um, so my NASA career. That's where I spent the bulk of it. Um, kind of varied. The first. Uh, Probably 15, uh, I spent as a materials researcher working composite materials, carbon fiber reinforced uh, plastics and, and things like that. For space applications, I really focused on how does the space environment affect those materials? Uh, you might think of the space environment being somewhat benign. Uh, in a sense, um, it is, but it can, you can have extreme temperature swings. You, you have radiation because you're not protected from the Earth's magnetosphere. Um, and, and you have micrometeoroids and debris. You get hit by little things. They can be very small, but they're traveling at very high velocities. So if you just do uh, the old uh, kinetic energy mv squared, um, you, you can get a lot of energy imparted. So spent a lot of time doing that. Had a lab. Um, 
at the research center and um, really enjoyed that. Um, I then got into uh, project management. Um, and I'll, I'll tell the story about how I got into project management and in, in, uh, I think maybe on the next slide, but spent about 12 years doing that, both aeronautics and space. Um, didn't really, uh, hadn't really worked a lot in aeronautics and a lot of people, probably me, one of them when I was younger, didn't really know NASA was involved in aeronautics, but that is the first A in, in NASA, as we like to say, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. So uh, NASA does a lot of fundamental research in aeronautics. That's how they started actually at NASA Langley Research Center, uh, who's been there now 105 years on, on the piece of ground they're on. They started as the National Advisory Committee for, for Aeronautics and was the first civilian aeronautics research lab uh, back in 1917. So a lot of history there. So managed some, um, got involved with project management and some exciting projects. Uh, we developed a full size composite wing for like a, a civilian transport size airplane. Uh, also uh, worked on something called the aging aircraft pro program where we were looking at fatigue damage on metallic structures after they got uh, over a certain age. Um, then I got into kind of a senior executive uh, leadership uh, positions, actually got back to space, uh, so to speak. Uh, I, I was responsible for all of the space exploration activities at the center, uh, both as deputy and then as the, the director of the, the space activities at the center. Worked on a lot of various programs, a lot of launch vehicle technology programs, and I'll, I'll show some photos and, and touch on some of those. Um, then I moved up to the office of director where I actually had three positions. Um, moved up there first as the associate center director where you're kind of responsible for the infrastructure of the center, of buildings, IT infrastructure, things like that. Then I was deputy director for a couple of years where you're focused more on the technical aspects of the center. And then as center director, you kind of got all of that. And, and um, so I was center director for five years. Um, very cool job. It wasn't like I was uh, running away for something. I just felt like um, at that point in my career, uh, I had done some things I wanted to accomplish at the center. And if I was going to go on and do something else, it was kind of either get out then or probably stay another five or six years and just retire, retire. So I, I did want to go try my hand at something else. And that's uh, where I am uh, now. So uh, the new journey we've talked about two years and counting, uh, and I'm really having a lot of fun. And, and, and I guess so the message, kind of the tagline on all this, I would say for me, this is what's uh, worked for me, was find your passion and follow it. Um, there is no one right path. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about my somewhat convoluted path on how I got there. And the other thing I would share is never stop learning or looking for new challenges. At least for me, that's what keeps uh, the job interesting. And, and that's what uh, that's what keeps life interesting at the end of the day. So um, let me share with you a video. There's a saying in the rocket business uh, that it never gets old. And uh, they're referring to launches uh, never get old. So I've got a video here that I'm going to play. It's only about a minute and a half long, so it's not too long. And I won't talk during the middle of it. I'll just let it play. Five, four, three, two, one. We have engine ignition. Woo! And
Okay. Uh, so uh, I, that's right up close to where I live. That's at the uh, Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport. Uh, that was a Northrop Grumman Antares uh, vehicle. I think it was NG-17, actually, that was taking cargo to the International uh, Space Station. That was just this past February. As you can see, it was a beautiful uh, February afternoon, hardly a cloud in the sky, cool, crisp, sunny day. Uh, and that was just um, quite an experience. And I've seen lots of launches. It truly does never get old. Uh, I did bring actually uh, one of our professional photographers uh, with me that day. Um, usually when I go to things like this, I'll take uh, a lot of my own photos, but I wanted to get, get, some, um, get some good footage of the launch. Um, so... Five. Whoops. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, here's just a collage of pictures. And I, I just want to, again, I, and there's, um, I've had lots of great opportunities. So I just want to share some of these with you as a way to say, hey, if you're involved in aerospace, especially the space side, you, you get a chance um, to, to be involved in things like this. And, and I will say all of these activities uh, take hundreds and hundreds of people. It, it's truly a team sport, a team effort. Um, and I've had been fortunate enough to be parts of teams that were involved in these things and, and participated in these things, but, um, it is a great team sport and it does have a lot of excitement around it. So starting in the upper left there, that was STS-132. So that's a space shuttle. Uh, this was like the third flight before retirement. I think this one was in 2010. Uh, that's kind of the iconic, what they call the vehicle assembly building, the building on the far left. And then that's a picture of the shuttle launch. Um, I will tell you, uh, I've got some other launch pictures on here, but uh, seeing a space shuttle is pretty cool. You really do feel um, feel it in your bones when the, the, the sound waves and the pressure waves kind of roll across uh, and, and hit you. That's, uh, I happen to be right outside the vehicle assembly building. That's kind of the official press site. And, and so that's just, was an amazing, uh, thing to see the space shuttle launch. The last launch was in 2011, but, um, and it's been amazing. Look back, uh, on that, uh, what are we now? 2022. So 10 plus, uh, years and so much has happened in the launch business in the space business and since then, and I'll, I'll touch on some of those. But the next one uh, going toward the right there uh, was in, it's called Ares 1X. It was a test vehicle that NASA was developing. Uh, it actually fell under my purview, uh, what I was leading at NASA Langley, and NASA Langley was responsible for all these systems engineering and integration on that vehicle. Um, Test was a big success. That was down at Kennedy Space um, Center, and that was November 2019. Uh, continuing on the right, you can see the sign there. It says CRS-10 SpaceX. So this was a SpaceX launch uh, back in 2017, again in February from Kennedy Space Center. Uh, NASA Langley's piece of this was we actually had an instrument uh, on board that was delivered to the International Space Station. It was called SAGE-3. SAGE stands for Stratospheric Aerosols and Gas Experiments. Uh, it actually helps measure the ozone in the Earth's atmosphere. It's on the space station right now, looking back at the Earth's atmosphere and help monitoring the ozone. Go down to the lower uh, slides or pictures there. That next one on the, on the far left is a picture of something called AA2, which is Ascent Abort Test Number Two. Uh, and this is for the launch abort system for the rocket uh, space launch system that NASA is currently developing. It's what gets the astronauts away from the rocket in case of a, uh, in case of a problem. Uh, it's at one system you hope you never have to use, but if you do have to use it, uh, it's got to work. You only have one chance. And, and again, NASA Langley was responsible for that. Uh, this picture, when was that? That was 2019. This was just a um, few months before I retired. You can see the sun was just coming up. Uh, and unfortunately, the, the vantage point we had was kind of looking right into the sun. So it was hard to get some good shots there. Uh, and the first one on the far left, I don't know what that little green dot is. Um, I don't think it was, uh, what do they call them now, UAPs? 
uh, unidentified aerial phenomena. I, I think it was just a spot on my iPhone um, camera lens. But um, anyway, that was a fantastic launch. Again, a total success uh, and um, was just happy to be there. This last one I'm gonna show you, and you might wonder what is that goofy looking um, selfie there. The first picture is the control room at the Jet Propulsion Lab. This was back in November of 2018. Um, and it was right when the Mars InSight lander landed on Mars. Uh, NASA Langley uh, was responsible for what we call the EDL, or Entry, Descent, and Landing of the vehicle. We've actually um, have been responsible for most uh, EDL uh, flight trajectories for everything that's uh, successfully landed on Mars, uh, starting back with the Viking project in the, in the 1970s. So uh, we had a team out there. Actually, we had people in the control room. Uh, at that point in my career, they wouldn't let me in the control room. I was actually standing on the outside of the glass looking in. They probably didn't want me wandering in, uh, accidentally touching anything. But uh, it was very cool right when it touched down. Uh, camera kicks on on one of the legs uh, of the lander, and that circle behind my head there is a picture of Mars just literally minutes um, after the thing landed. Uh, so that was that was pretty cool, uh, watching something land, uh, at least from afar, uh, on Mars and being part of realizing that you helped uh, send a spacecraft all the way to Mars is, is pretty um pretty exciting. So I just wanted to uh, share that. Like I said, all of these things take a huge, huge team effort. You can see there's a big team in the control room there at JPL, but there are literally hundreds and hundreds, uh, if not thousands of people involved in every time uh, we land something on Mars or we launch or a private company like Northrop Grumman, who launches commercial resupply missions to the International Space Station from Wallops or SpaceX, which launches them um, um, from Kennedy. And they also launch um, people you now to the International uh, Space Station. And Boeing just had a successful uh, unmanned test flight of their uh, capsule that's gonna take uh, humans uh, to the International Space Station. So a lot of exciting things going on. Uh, again, I just put some of these in to help share uh, some of that excitement with you. It, it is an exciting uh, industry to be involved with. All right, next slide. Um, I couldn't do a talk without sharing you know, some special people and moments. And I was very, very fortunate uh, to be involved with Katherine Johnson of Hidden Figures fame. Have a, Hopefully everybody's heard of the movie Hidden Figures, the book uh, Hidden Figures. Uh, actually, the author of the book, Margot Lee Shetterly, her uh, father, no, yes, her father worked at NASA Langley, actually knew him. Um, this was all before the book came out. I didn't work closely with him, but um, just an amazing story. If, if I, I would read the book and then see the movie, um, the book just has some more fascinating details in it. But um, back in 2015, uh, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I was fortunate enough to uh, attend that activity. There we are with a picture of Catherine. Uh, that's Leland Melvin, another NASA Langley employee who was also an astronaut uh, and the administrator of NASA at the time, Charlie Bolden on the other side who was also a NASA astronaut and NASA administrator. So I was in, and Katherine Johnson herself. So I was, uh, I was definitely um, in very good company with, with the three of those individuals. But that was a very special moment being part of the ceremony at, at the White House for the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Uh, if you go to the other pictures on the right, we actually did a special screening before it came, came out of the Hidden Figures movie down at the Virginia Air and Space Center. Uh, and we had Catherine and her family, but we also had Octavia Spencer, who played uh, Dorothy Vaughn in the movie. She was actually there for the special showing. This was, what, in December, I think, before the movie came out uh, in early January 2017. This was probably December uh, 16. So I had a chance just to um, share a memento uh, with, with Octavia and Spencer. And it was just so great. Uh, being there with a lot of Catherine's family, 
Catherine was there. Uh, just a fantastic event. Yeah. And then we had a chance uh, to name a facility, uh, a brand new facility that was being built uh, at the center at the time uh, to house our data center and computational um, research equipment. And so we named it the Ka Catherine G. Johnson Computational Research Facility. So again, we had Catherine and her family out to the center uh, for the ribbon cutting um, and, and just truly an amazing person. Um, unfortunately, she just passed away a couple of years ago at 101. Uh, but was still active uh, in, the, in the community. Uh, her family, uh, her two daughters uh, still live on the Virginia Peninsula uh, over there. It's just an amazing story. And I just wanted to share this. Uh, she was such a humble person, uh, but she never let anybody tell her she couldn't do something. And, and again, I don't I won't go into all the details in the book, she, but she was pretty much involved in um, all of NASA's space program and making it happen. Uh, you know, the movie concentrates a lot on John Glenn, who was the first US uh, the person to orbit uh, the planet. And she was big in that. And she was also big um, and helped with the Apollo program. Uh, so an amazing person, uh, but she never let anybody tell her you couldn't do it. So my message when I talk uh, to young people and students, um, and whoever, don't don't let people say you can't uh, do anything. She she went, she came from West Virginia, um, and and she came to NASA Langley in 1953. So if you if just think about where we were as a country uh, in 1953, and uh, the amazing things uh, she did, it it truly is uh, an amazing story, and I was very blessed to be part of it. All right, so what are some lessons learned uh, in learning? Uh, that, that's my other key point. Don't, don't ever stop learning. But, you know, at, at a top level, I would say turn challenges into opportunities. Don't be afraid to try new things. Use all your skills. Uh, I, I truly believe I have used all those skills back from my first job selling clothes uh, to, <laughs> to my job wandering around the state collecting water samples um, to, that have led me to where I am. And I would say also search out and use uh, mentors. I've had some fantastic mentors along the way. And you can't over, un, uh, you know, you can't say enough about mentors. They, they truly have helped me in my career. I will say one thing I, I, I was going to say, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't be afraid to try new things and, and turn challenges and opportunities. So I, I, when I was talking about my NASA career, I said I started as a composites researcher. What led me over into program project management was actually uh, we were going uh, through some management changes at the time in the organization I was in. Um, we had a reorganization. I actually was not happy uh, with the reorganization and my role in the new organization. Uh, so I decided to look for a different job on the center. Uh, went over in program project management and had never done that. I was also, the first job was working in aeronautics and I had never done that. So I, I, some people would say it's all worked out pretty good. I am where I am. So I, again, uh, turn those challenges into opportunities and, and don't ever be afraid to try new things. All right, uh, I'm going to spend... And we could spend hours talking about this slide uh, and I'll touch it at a high level, but I truly believe uh, the future has never looked, um, never looked brighter. You know, I, I, I really believe technology is transforming terrestrial uh, transportations of goods and people. Just look at some of the things going on. Supersonic air travel over land. NASA has its X-59 demonstration plane being developed right now. Uh, researchers back at the center have, have figured out a way to shape the sonic boom so you really doesn't sound like a boom. It just sounds like a, a low rumble. And that will open up being able to travel commercial supersonic over land. You know, we've had supersonic flight for a while. The Concorde uh, used to fly, but it can only uh, fly over the uh, water where sonic, you weren't going to be um, Sonic boom uh, and its effect on people and, and just the annoyance factor wasn't there. And, and it was hard to make a business case just flying over water. This will open up all types of new uh, opportunities. 
NASA's advanced air mobility and personal air travel, uh, whether piloted or autonomous. So much going on there. So many new vehicles, all the way from um, what we call quadcopters uh, to personal air taxis. I think that that whole business is just going to take off. Uh, a lot of electric vehicles, potentially hydrogen powered vehicles. Uh, I think they'll start probably with the piloted uh, versions, at least for moving people. But I think ultimately they will turn into autonomous uh, vehicles and, and autonomous vehicles uh, and small drones for delivering packages. That's already happening, happening and it's only going to grow. Uh, autonomous grounded maritime systems. You're seeing more and more of that. Uh, I think the pandemic has opened up um, a realization of the uh, of the supply chain and, and the fragility of it maybe is a, is a good way to uh, say it and how dependent we are on the supply chain. And, and that supply chain really includes everything, you, you know, from air, ground, ground uh, water, rail, uh, and autonomous systems are really gaining a, a foothold in that area. And I think it opened up some great opportunities. Hypersonic uh, passenger travel, um, that would be at like Mach 5 or above where you might start out like a conventional airplane, accelerate to Mach 5 using an air breathing propulsion type system. So here you're talking about going from one side of the globe to the other, uh, from the US to Asia in just a, a, couple, a couple hours, uh, could totally. Now that's a ways off. There are still technical challenges. There are obviously technical challenges with all of those things, but I, I'm a firm believer that they're going to happen, uh, and it's just a matter of time. Space is the same way. Space, you can truly say space is opening up to everyone, and I'm a firm believer growing up uh, with the original Star Trek. It is the next frontier. I don't know whether it's the final frontier, uh, but it's certainly the next frontier, so you've got new low-cost access for satellites, all sizes. Um, one of the things where I'm involved in in my new job is, is uh, developing CubeSat missions for the Northrop Grumman uh, vehicle that launches out of Wallops. You're seeing commercial passengers and, and really uh, space tourism. You, uh, with uh, the Blue Origins, the SpaceX's, you're, you're just seeing much more democratization, if, I will, if you will, and, and commercialization of space. And that's only going to grow. Moon and Mars habitation. NASA is definitely working on that. Um, SpaceX is also uh, working on that. And, and, you know, people, when I used to work at NASA, used to say, hey, do you, what do you think about these commercial companies and, and the competition? I don't see it as a competition at all. Space is a, is a big place. A, <laughs> there's room for everybody. And, and I think NASA's role is doing the thing that, that leads to commercial opportunities. Then we move on uh, to the next thing and depend on uh, entities like universities and, and the fundamental research to drive those next things. So very excited about that. Space infrastructure, you know, whether it be uh, fueling depots in space or orbiting platforms for servicing and in-space servicing assembly and manufacturing, all of those things are happening and um, they're only gonna continue to happen. And, and again, as I said, it is the next uh, frontier. And ultimately, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's moving out into the solar system and beyond. Uh, that's a ways off. Uh, you know, there's, there's propulsion and time issues. Um, and there are obviously lots of other technical issues. Uh, you know, the sp space effects on, on humans, uh, radiation being one of those. But hey, all of these things are being worked on every day. Uh, and, and I think we truly are going to move away and move out into space. And everyone can participate. Actually, I should have said everyone needs to participate uh, to make this successful. And all skills are required. It's not just STEAM. It's, I mean, it's not just STEM. It's, it's STEAM with the, with the arts in the most general sense of that word. As I said before, all of those pictures that I showed earlier, they take uh, all of these missions. Um, any of these great endeavors takes a whole team and it takes all these skills, uh, not just engineering sales skills, science skills, business skills, um, just you name it. There's, there's no skill 
that's the arts. How do we communicate this? How do we inspire the next generation? Arts and communication are a big piece of this. So, hey, the future is happening. Uh, I, I, you know, we need to be part of it. Everybody, I think, should be part of it. In in what I was trying to convey today, it is uh, it's an exciting future, and and you can be part of it. Uh, and and so look for those opportunities where you can. I am know we're running play short on time. I'll give you a, a few, some final thoughts on leadership and teamwork. Um, some general comments first and then kind of my leadership uh, rules in no particular order, but general com comments, you know, leadership and teamwork, what is it? Well, to me, it's really a, achieving a shared vision slash results that is greater than the sum of the individual parts or strengths of the groups. It's built on trust. Uh, I would say we're all leaders at different times and in different situations during our life. Uh, and one thing I've learned, there's no one right leadership style. Uh, I've got lots of books on leadership. I've taken lots of leadership training. Uh, I think good leaders can adapt their styles to the, uh, to the situation and team they're leading. And in, in one of my rules, and I don't think, it, I think it's on the next one, you have to be the leader you are. You have to be authentic. So let's get all these rules. Um, First of all, listen, listen, listen. Can't listen too much. Uh, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. Um, you're not leading if no one's following. So remember to take time to look over your shoulder. Um, as, as I said, I've worked with a, a lot of different people. Uh, I had one uh, leader that sometimes forgot to do this and we had to go tap him on the shoulder and say, whoa, time out. Uh, you might have a great vision, but we're not there yet. So help us, help us, get, help us get there. Surround yourself with people who are different from you. There, there's so much strength and in innovation from, from getting perspectives and ideas from, from different people. Uh, that's so important. Take time to celebrate the successes. Um, it's hard work and, and you gotta take some time to celebrate those successes. Take care of your team and each other and they'll take care of you. That's a that's kind of a no brainer. Don't be a victim. Uh, and what I mean by that, look in the mirror before you start pointing fingers. I've had to do this a lot of times. You're like, God, if, if this hadn't happened or so-and-so didn't do this. A lot of times it's you're part of the problem. Um, so before you start pointing fingers, take a look in the mirror and say, okay, how am I making, uh, what, what am I contributing to this dysfunction? Uh, be deliberate in your words and actions. People are watching. Know yourself, um, build on your strengths, improve your weaknesses. Um, this is one I was talking about. Be the leader you are. You have to be authentic. You can, um, again, I've, I've looked at lots and read lots of leadership books. Um, and you have to take all those. They all have great lessons in them. Take them and mold them to your personality, your style. Um, do all of those things you were supposed to learn in kindergarten. You know, share, play nice. Uh, they're so important. At the end of the day, uh, it sounds trivial, but they are. Or, and probably if I said these weren't in any particular order, but probably from my standpoint, one of the most important ones is the next. Always assume positive intent when you're going into a new situation with a new group of people. It makes such a big difference. If you go in assuming negative intent on some individual's uh, part, you'll probably you'll probably subconsciously portray some negative vibe and it will just, it won't turn out good. Things turn out so much better if you always assume positive intent and that has served me well. Email, social media, great way to transfer information, but um, don't let it take the place of talking to people. I've, I've been in lots of situations where things sometimes get confused during a communication. Um, when, if you just picked up, uh, the phone or, or walk down the hall, talk to, to somebody. And the last one, uh, just um, I've, I've kind of lived by this, make at least one person smile every day, including yourself. Life's too short not to. Uh, and with that, I think I'm at the end. So thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. So I'll stop sharing and we'll go from there. Thank you, Dr. Bowles, for talking with yeah. us about your groundworking work at NASA and the Virginia Institute for Space Flight and Autonomy, um, and also for talking with us about the future of aerospace and space exploration. You mentioned a lot of things that I hadn't heard about before, and it's really exciting for us to know that many of the people that are listening us to, to us right now might have a part in being, being in the future and making those uh, explorations and innovations. 
So now we're going to take questions from our live audience and to our audience, a reminder that you may continue to submit your questions into the Q&A box on your Zoom screen, and we will answer as many as time allows. So the first question that we have is from someone who's asking if there are any space career opportunities available for international students because they've heard that international students cannot work in the US military based jobs. And they were wondering if there's any cases where other space related careers are open to international students that have to do with outer space. Oh, I'm sorry, David, I think you're, uh, I believe you're muted. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, no I worries. Some, uh, had some computer problems there, but I think everything's good now. Uh, so the short answer is yes, uh, with a caveat, uh, depending if you're working uh, with federal government entities. Uh, yes, there sometimes are requirements uh, for U.S. citizenship. Uh, but one of the things I tried to convey, first of all, there's lots of commercial entities, uh, not just in the U.S. I, I, I didn't point out there's a lot of things going on internationally. Um, we, we had a call with Visa, uh, a call with the Turkish um, Aerospace uh, Space Agency the other day talking about how we could work together. Uh, there's things go I know big, and I'll leave somebody out. That's why I hate to start listing individual countries because I'm glad I can leave the, the, the bulk of them out. But it's, it is a very international thing. When I say space is opening up and is the next frontier, it goes for the U.S., but it goes for the whole globe. Uh, it really is opening up. So there, there are opportunities internationally. There's also opportunities for international students within the U.S., I think, through private companies. They, they, they have more flexibilities. And there are so many new companies um, coming into this um, area every day, both from an autonomous vehicle standpoint, but also a launch vehicle, satellite. Um, I, I, I get various news feeds from uh, various uh, aerospace organizations, and, and they come out every day. And it's like, well, there's five new companies that weren't there yesterday. So short answer is yes. Uh, if you want to work with the U.S. government, that sometimes can be uh, a little more challenging, but yeah, don't, don't let that get in your way. Uh, as Katherine Johnson would say, don't, um, yeah, work around it. You can, you, you can, you can find a path. No, and that's a really good um, segue because there are universities also where international students can come to the U S or any, um, any other universities in Europe, and they can certainly work on research that helps advance, um, aerospace related research. Um, Absolutely. We also have, um, there's also developments that are happening in Europe in terms of space agencies in Central America as well. So like Dr. Yes. Bowles said that, you know, don't let any of those issues stop you from doing, accomplishing your dream. And maybe you're somebody who could start your own company too and take us to, to Mars or to the moon. Absolutely. The other question we have is, how do you think we can enable international scientists to work at NASA? And I know you touched a little bit on that, but are there any projects where international scientists are working, are welcome to work with other scientists at NASA? Yeah, there, there are lots of uh, international programs. In fact, most of the science uh, activities uh, that happen, uh, well, as a center director, I was involved in a lot of those. I, I talked about SAGE-3, was an instrument we developed that actually, if I remember correctly, had some subsystems, I think, on the instrument that were international. But I know we've done other science missions, both at NASA Langley and throughout the agency, where we've collaborated uh, either with the European Space Agent or Space Agency or the Indian uh, Space Research uh, Organization and Agency. Uh, so, yes, uh, absolutely. I know I've... Uh, had one-on-one -on -one, uh, back in my previous uh, job with, uh, with the French uh, about uh, joint um, instruments and science instruments. Uh, most of the big science uh, missions in NASA always have um, uh, some type of international collaboration. I mean, and it's to just Google, you know, uh, NASA science uh, international cooperation and, and 
you'll find tons of stuff. So again, yes, very much so. And Dr. Bowles, from working at ODU, I'm thinking also of projects related to resilience. So at Old Dominion University, we had scientists that were working with scientists at NASA. And then NASA also has been working with scientists in countries like Costa Rica, where they were using satellite observations to track how much the sea level has been increasing, as well as how much land has been subsiding, which leads to flooding. Ab great point, absolutely. Uh, the ICAR, Institute for Coastal Adaptation and Resiliency at ODU, led by Jess Whitehead, my, my good friend. Uh, yes, there are numerous opportunities there. And I know Jess and myself have both been working with NASA in collaboration opportunities because that the the problem you just described you know sea level rise uh, uh land subsidence uh it's not a u.s only problem it's a global uh problem and and again a lot of these global problems we we try to work them internationally and cooperate uh, ac across the globe one of the things we've done individually within visa is set up a data sharing platform called the, uh, the virginia open data cube where you can take satellite data and combine it with, say, drone data or data from flood sensors and things like that. And it gets it all in one place where you can really take all this data and then better understand what the potential um, problems could be, but also helps you define what potential mitigation strategies uh, you might want to adapt. So, yeah, great example. I love hearing about that collaboration because it makes me think of, you know, if I have satellite data, and you perhaps have other, maybe you have scientists on the field taking measurements in the water, we can collaborate. And then together we can join all the information that we have and make a better sense of the challenge that we're seeking to solve. So that's, that's really great to hear. I hope Absolutely. some of these examples have given our friends some ideas to, to see how, what are some ways that they can collaborate with scientists, no matter where you come from. Um, one of the other questions that we had, and I know you touched a little bit about this earlier, was how do you feel about companies like SpaceX who wish to commercialize or privatize space exploration? And I, if I remember correctly, your answer was, you know, that you felt that there's plenty of room for everyone. Absolutely. Uh, and, and so, um, yeah, I, I think that NASA should be in the role of developing technologies and demonstrating technologies to help company develop and new companies arise and start commercializing space. Uh, it's, it's really, I, um, I, I tell people it's a lot, a lot like our mission in aeronautics, NASA's mission in aeronautics. We, we don't run an airline, we're not building airplanes. We're developing uh, new research and new technology to make air, airplanes fly cheaper, safer, more environmentally friendly. Uh, same thing in space, uh, once it's to the point where commercial companies can come in and start providing that service, fantastic. That is what we should be all about. And then we can move on to the next thing where there might not be a commercial, um, uh, a viably commercial activity right now, but we can, we NASA, I, and I apologize, I keep saying we, I worked there so long, it's hard to <laughs> separate myself sometimes. Uh, but NASA can, can develop it to the point where it can be a commercial, commercially viable enterprise. And then we should move on to the next thing. So yes, I don't see it as a competition at all. Uh, and I think most people at NASA take a lot of pride in seeing the growth in commercial space. Uh, so yeah, very much so. It was really intriguing to me when you talked about manufacturing and refueling in space because it's, it's kind of like an obvious thing, but I frankly, I hadn't thought about it before that there are so many opportunities beyond space exploration, but even for the space exploration missions, you need to have other areas and businesses that are supporting that in space, right? So I imagine if parts go bad so you can build them, right? Is that what you yep. meant? I, the manufacturing yeah. part? That was pretty fascinating. I can imagine having kind of fueling stations in space, right? Yeah, I mean, think about it is, you know, if we truly want to have a sustainable presence off this planet, whether it be in orbit or in the planet uh, on the surface of another planet, whether it be uh, moon, Mars or, or beyond, uh, you need at some level, you need the same type of infrastructure we have here. 
right? Uh, maybe a little more complicated, some more technical challenges, but you need, quote, roads. Uh, you, need, you need infrastructure, you need buildings, you need gas stations, you need places to grow food. I mean, all of that infrastructure, as, as, as human presence becomes bigger and more sustainable, you need all of that infrastructure. So yeah, exactly. So hopefully your friends, you know, someone in the audience can help us in the future with that. <laughs> Um, someone else is writing that they're currently working in the biotech field and but have degrees in engineering like you, and they were wondering mm -hmm. if there's any space relevant opportunities on the biological sciences, biotechnical side of things. Um, I know just because I, I'm in communications, but I'm kind of a geek in terms of all things science, especially space, and I know that uh, there are some biologists that were working on growing foods in space and things like that. So that's one example. But what are some other things that you can think about to answer this person's question? Well, I mean, the food is, uh, is an obvious one. Actually, I was on campus uh, last week and I was talking to Dr. Asundi, who works over the mechanical and aerospace department. He was showing me some um, a facility he had built that you could study the effects of what was it electromagnetic radiation on plant growth? But uh, the whole, um, you know, biological human physiology and biology is a is a huge field. Uh, we know a lot. We know a lot, but but understanding the long duration impacts on human physiology is is a big. Um, there's still a lot to learn, whether it be the long term effects of of microgravity, long term effects of, of a radiation environment that's definitely uh, higher than we have here on Earth. I mean, lots of the radiation coming at the Earth is deflected or absorbed by the Earth's magnetosphere. So, uh, yeah, I think, again, the short answer kind of goes back to that one slide. All these skills you, you need. <laughs> I can't think of a skill you don't you don't need uh, to truly uh, grow and in, in for this future that that I envision. So. Mm -hmm. And like you said earlier, it's not even limited to the sciences. Um, you mentioned arts. I mean, obviously, if there's simulations that people need to do, you need an artist who can create them. Um, I was thinking also that there are people who work in human resources, for example, who do the hiring of, of uh, folks and recruit them to work at NASA and other uh, space exploration companies. Um, the business yes. folks, you said, to run the books, right? Make sure that the bills are paid, that you receive the grants for research, all of those all of those activities. I actually, um, I know at NASA Langley and it's, it's true at any NASA center. Um, yeah, probably, I'm trying to think of, a, you know, probably a third to a half of the people that work there are not engineers. Uh, I mean, it takes truly a village to, to run that type of organization and, and all the skills you just mentioned, Giovanna, are, are required. I met also some physicists, so yes. who work at NASA. Absolutely. So a variety of careers is the answer, right? So that's really Absolutely. great to hear. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Um, let me see what else do we have here. Um, someone is asking, how hard is it getting into the aerospace industry with a bachelor in physics? See, and I just mentioned physics. Um. I would say, uh, given where we are in today's economy, and you hear about job shortages, um, yeah, I would say um, it shouldn't be that hard. Uh, physics um, is kind of the underlying principles for pretty much uh, everything that goes on in space. You know, engineers kind of help turn that that physics into working machines and things, but I. I Actually, a lot of the people I worked with just had physics degrees uh, back at NASA Langley and people I deal with today. So, yeah, I, I think, again, figure out what path you want to do uh, and just just go ask. Don't be bashful. Go out there and see what's available. Don't think you can, don't ever think you can't do it. Go go make your case. Uh, and the other thing, if it's not what you thought it was going to be in a particular job, they're not for life. You can change jobs. Um, I, I, I spent a lot of time at one place, but I had a lot of different jobs when I was there. 
uh, I did a lot of different things. So don't, don't ever be afraid to try new things and, and go out and just um, follow your, follow your passion. And I know we're running a little bit over time. Do you have just a few minutes? We have just a few more yeah, questions sure. that people ask. Um, sure. People were asking if you have an end goal and what does that look like in terms of yeah. your career? Well, what in, well, so I'll, I'll answer that in two ways. I've, I've got a vision for the, this new organization I'm running, uh, Visa. Uh, and it's, it's, it's akin to maybe not at the same scale. People talk about Florida's Space Coast. So Cocoa Beach, the Kennedy Space Center, uh, Patrick Air Force Base. I mean, I mean, just you look at the amount of commercial space activities going on down there is amazing. I think we have a chance to have something similar over here on the Eastern shore. Uh, we have now two launch providers launching from Wallops, um, North of Grumman and the new entrant is Rocket Lab. They're actually gonna have their manufacturing facility here. Uh, I think that will lead um, to second tier suppliers who want to be part of that manufacturing chain. And then I think it's very, very reasonable. And part of my job is help helping this uh, to happen is satellite manufacturers. Uh, they want to be close to where the satellites get integrated into the launch vehicle. And, and so once you kind of have a critical mass, it starts to grow. And so my vision uh, for Visa is helping Virginia and, and the, the Eastern Shore over here be that place for growth. Because the growth is going to happen, and and I think we over here can be part of that. Uh, my personal um, kind of vision for for my career, part of it is what I'm doing now. Uh, I, and again, I said, I think I said up front, one of my passions was um, to work in aerospace, but also be involved in education, uh, helping um, you know inform and and hopefully maybe inspire uh people to get into this field and and so as long as i can keep doing that and adding value um uh I'm, i have a very uh i'll be very blessed if i can continue to do that so absolutely yeah. and um this is a question if you're not ready to to answer it now we can always follow up with attendees via email mm -hmm. But they would like to know what are some of the books that you may recommend for someone wanting to work in the aerospace industry. So again, you're welcome to to answer it now. But if not, we are happy to follow up with attendees and send them a list of books that you recommend. Yeah, let me. Uh, I'm I'm trying to think off the top of my head, and I'm uh, I'm actually sitting in my office at home, and I could get up and go look in my book uh, case. But uh, let me send you a list. I, I think, uh, you know, obviously um, from a technical standpoint depending on what kind of career field you want to follow um have a good have a good basic fundamental understanding of whatever field you want to go into from a technical side or whether it be business or whatever so know know your stuff uh, but from a um you know there there's several good leadership books uh i've, I've got a whole bookcase uh of them yeah I'll, we'll, we'll follow up on that if That'll that's okay Giovanna. so yeah. i guess look okay. look for our email <laughs> To All the right. Reyes mailing list with, with uh, okay. the book recommendations for Dr. Bowles. And the last question we have is, do you think we are past the golden age of space exploration? No, that, that seemed too easy. No, I don't think, <laughs> well, so I guess it depends on uh, how you define golden age. Um, yeah, and, um, the, the, yeah, maybe there's a, a, a more specific uh definition of, of golden age, then that's eluding me. But no, I, I whether you call it golden age or the next frontier, I, I think we, we've done tremendous things, but I, I think it's only going to be more and more open to more and more people across the globe. It, it's just, I, I think I would put it more as um, over the last five years and the next five to 10 years, we're kind of at that tipping point where again, as I said, it kind of starts to feed on itself. You get more more people going into space. You get more infrastructure built up there. The cost of getting to space comes down. Uh, it, it just starts to uh, f um, you know feed itself as an industry. So, I, and I think we're we're right in the middle of that. So maybe that's a better way to say it. Yeah. No, I was thinking that too. I mean, I heard you say Mars habitation, supersonic air travel over land. Yeah. I heard you yeah. talk about hydrogen powered vehicles. 
yeah. um, helping with supply chain with autonomous systems. I mean, I feel like there's, we're just getting started and I cannot yeah. wait to see what the future holds for all of us. So very good. Me too. Well, thanks again for joining us on behalf of Old Dominion University and the Reyes program planning team. I would like to thank Dr. Bowles one more time for joining us today. We will continue to follow your professional journey and its impact on aerospace for years to come. I'd like to also extend my gratitude to the Office of University Communications, to the Virginia Institute for Space Flight and Autonomy, and the Office of Distance Learning for their support of this event. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in. For more information about our free virtual summer program, be sure to visit our website at odu.edu slash Reyes. Registration is now open for our summer virtual program, and we look forward to seeing all of you on June 27th. Today's session has been recorded, and if you'd like to watch it again or share it with friends, you can access it from the Reyes website at odu.edu slash Reyes. This concludes today's program. Please have a wonderful rest of your day. See you soon. Bye-bye.